Good evening and a very warm welcome. And uh, we are so delighted to see so many of you, uh, both uh, because the subject of our conversations this evening uh, is seminal uh, to uh, our lives, not only as they unfold now, but if it's a cliche that uh, the child is the father of man and woman, um, that uh, what is unfolding in our times is of uh, crucial significance and importance, uh, not only to us gathered here or to the country, but I would argue to the human species. Uh, and that is the, the kind of crisis that we confront today. And it is only through the nurturing uh, of the young that I think there is uh, a possibility and hope for the planet. But uh, uh, more of that uh, later. This is just uh, uh, to introduce and welcome uh, the author of this very uh, remarkable book, uh, which uh, you know we could spend uh, a very long time uh, discussing because it is so rich uh, in detail and nuance, uh, and above all, because you know we we are we are, we are overwhelmed with the generalizations of what is happening in this time of anxiety. Uh, but the book uh, documents uh, and makes real uh, the lived experience of uh, children and uh, parents, and I think you know that's substantially the community that has uh, gathered here. So a very warm welcome. Uh, to the author of the book, uh, Abba Adams, uh, and, and to many of us, she's been a friend, certainly to us, for more than 50 years. So this moment has uh, a, a, sort of a very s special sense of uh, joy and celebration uh, for a remarkable human being. Uh, she has spent uh, 37 years in education. She worked with the BBC, uh, the Arts Management for the Arts Council of India, and of England, and uh, she was a former director of the Sri Ram Schools and advisor education to step-by-step -step school in Noida, and was instrumental in founding and developing two major edu other educational institutions in India. So she's someone who's uh, had hands-on experience uh, with children, both in creating the systems and processes of education, uh, and of course in engaging and in, in, in shaping their lives. Uh, she has worked with uh, you know, numerous uh, multilateral agencies, state governments and foundations, and policy and strategy, and uh, with the Delhi government to up help them upgrade uh, their schools and to ensure uh, learning outcomes that are uh, in, in tune with a larger vision and aspiration uh, for young people and to cultivate uh, teacher skills and proficiencies. We're also deeply privileged to have uh, Dr. Uh, Shalja Sen, uh, who again has uh, uh, sort of lived hands-on experience uh, in working with young people. And she began her life more than 25 years ago in a variety of contexts in India and the United Kingdom. Uh, she is a narrative therapist, and I'm intrigued by what a narrative therapist does, and we will ask her to explain that in a moment. And she has uh, authored uh, several critically acclaimed books. She's been a TED speaker, a columnist for the Indian Express, and a clinical tutor at the University of Melbourne and uh, the International Faculty at the Dulwich Centre Foundation in Adelaide, Australia. Uh, she has co-founded a remarkable NGO called Children First, and this is really what our evening is about, an institute for child and adolescent mental health needs. Her work centers around the understanding that stories the children sometimes grow up internalizing as truths and, and the steps we can take to help them reconstruct uh, those narratives. So uh, uh, while uh, you applaud them, I will present them as is our, uh, our tradition. Uh, with the Foundation for Universal Responsibility with the Khatas, and also uh, to acknowledge and celebrate uh, Usha Munshi of the Indian International Center, the librarian, uh, who uh, has been a wonderful partner enabling many of our foundation activities, and with that instinctive sense of uh, what will work. And she immediately agreed to our proposition to do this discussion. And thank you, Ushaji for all your uh, support over the years and hopefully to come. An applause for Abha and Shalta.
Well, I have to confess I'm at a loss where to begin uh, because the uh, book is so very exhaustive and, uh, and so detailed. And so I'm going to plunge straight in and uh, uh, ask uh, Abha, from all those wonderful, insightful pages, uh, if I were to ask you, what is the book about? What would you say? <laughs> and, 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 you know, sum up its, its essential uh, message. A very good evening to everybody, and apologies for those who are standing. I feel your aching feet keenly. And I'm only procrastinating because I'm thinking hard of how to respond <laughs> to Rajiv's <laughs> question. And, the, you know, where does one start? Um, my thanks to Pujita, Krishnan of Aleph, who approached me to write a book on education. And at that time, I wasn't sure what kind of book it ought to be. And um, the more I thought about it, I thought back on how my experiences as an educator had changed, specifically in the last 10 years, which I really believe have been the hardest for parents and for educators alike, and indeed for children. So that got me thinking, why? Why have the last 10 years been hardest? Every generation has its problems, and every generation uh, thinks that um, it's having the rough time. Um, and when I delved deeper and deeper, I saw that there were several forces, and forces of change, cataclysmic shifts, I call them. And um, these were driving consumerism, where the mantra is shop till you drop, and there is a proliferation of products available in the market for us as consumers. Consumers are being targeted at a younger and younger age. Four-year-olds are targeted as consumers. Babies pick up subliminal messages. There's this amazing man called Vance Packard who wrote way back in the 70s, and he doesn't have a mention in the book, but his books were called The Hidden Persuaders and The Waste Makers, both of them highly, highly worth reading. And the point was that we are unaware of how we are being manipulated as parents, as educators, and as children. And there is no conversation around what is called media literacy. So one is the consumerism and the drive to buy, buy, buy. The second was, as a consequence of that, is commercialization. And you know, commercialization of practically every aspect of our lives. So. There was this wonderful article that Shelda wrote, and I'm going to ask her to talk about it a little bit, about the baby industry, the baby birth industry. So even before your baby is born, and there are several funny anecdotes about my own personal life and anxiety as a parent, and that remains. I don't see my son here, so clearly he's late. So uh, the anxiety that I had as a parent, um, I didn't have to fight the commercialization of what to do when a child is born, um, how to prepare for the birth, what to buy. It's all about buying. And you know, moms and mother-in-laws are pushing off overseas and stuffing the bags full of clothes to bring back for the newborn baby. From there, we move on to uh, preschool. And which preschool to go to? And there's another sort of commercial spin on that one. We then move on to the big school. From there we move on, to, not even there, earlier we move on to the activities industry. And what are the activities you can do so that your child becomes a veritable genius? What apps you can have, how you lose pregnancy fat, apps for that as well. So there is this amazing proliferation of products that are commercialized. And sadly, education also falls into that place, space. So all of this is when you add uh, the digitalization of our lives, it makes it a very toxic mix. Um, we'll talk about digitization, I hope, and the whole smartphone business in a, in a little while. But um, what results eventually is the fact that what emerges from the social media platforms for our young people, for us as young parents, 
for this world that is screaming outside with, you need this, you need this, you need this, is the f we lose control of our own thought process and decision making. Is this right for me? You lose that perspective. You follow what you're told by the hidden persuaders. And then you buy. And then you're disappointed. Because of course, it doesn't in any way come near what it sets out to achieve. And so that was where it started. And with that comes parental expectation, aspiration, anxiety. That drives children to feeling, I'm just not good enough. I'm never going to be good enough. Therefore, a sense of failure. Never before have children felt a sense of failure so much as today. I don't want to complete t talking about the book, but I want Shelda to talk about the first aspect of commercialization that I spoke about. Thank you, Abba. Um, good evening to all of you. We talk about anxiety. I see a lot of um, teachers here of my own children. So I'm just wondering, I'm talking about parenting here with my children who are much older now. <laughs> so yeah, a little bit of anxiety at this, but also a sense of collective that we have here. You know, people who know each other, people who care, people who are coming together to have these meaningful conversations because we are all concerned. We want to do something different. We are doing different. I think each one of us here would be trying in different ways. And sometimes it's so important to come together and say, OK, what else do we need to do? So uh, talking about commercialization, yes, I think as a parent, uh, my, both my children were born in the UK. At that time, as a parent, you want to do, even, I mean, any time, you want to do anything for your child, right? You, somebody says, you try this and you want to try this. You, as if you kind of, especially for mothers, I think for both fathers, mothers, especially the sense of guilt is so strong. I think mother's middle name should be guilt. <laughs> we carry that guilt. Every mother I meet carries that guilt. You know, there's constant, did I do something wrong in my pregnancy? Maybe it's because I had too much of coffee. Maybe because I was shouted too much or whatever. I've, every mother I meet carries that guilt, right? And in that guilt is, how is that guilt exploited? How is that guilt exploited by commercialization? <clears throat> How is it, uh, you know, if I, if I don't put my baby in this workshop, other kids will get a head start, my baby will not. I'm not being fair to my baby. If I don't send my child for this particular activity, my baby will be left behind, right? So there's a lot of guilt that is being exploited. And this exploitation continues. We're talking about uh, the digital world, um, you know, like I shared with you, Abha, that we are not the consumers of our digital world. We are the products. Our children are the products. We are the products because that's being, we are being sold to advertisers. And sometimes we are not even aware. Where is it being taught? How we generally say, oh, Instagram and Snapchat, terrible. But what is terrible about it? How are the kids getting addicted to it? How is it that they are constantly comparing themselves to what is there on Instagram, on social media? Every time, they, that's, they are hooked onto that, right? And um, because that's the way they're designed. There's a multi-billion dollar industry. Our kid's brain is nothing in compared to that. You're telling your child, don't be on Instagram, it's not going to solve anything. Because this is the best of the Silicon Valley is getting together to craft this for our, us and our children. So, you know, when you tell your child, don't do it, it really is not going to make much of a difference, right? Um, now, you talked about failure. That's my favorite topic, actually. Because every child I meet, every parent I meet, struggles with this idea of failure. I think all of us sometimes struggle with this idea of failure. And I love what you said, Ava. I resonate so much with it. I feel like an anthropologist. I've been in this field for more than 30 years now. right? I feel like an anthropologist seeing how mental health has changed. And what I see is 
Never before has this sense of failure affected, impacted our children as much as it is doing now, right? And where is this failure coming from? The sense of failure is coming from because right from a very early age, we are indoctrinating our children and we are part of it. We're part of this discourse, so let's not blame it on there, somewhere outside the door. We are all part of it. We are indoctrinating our children. This is the right way to live a life. This is a good child is equal to good student is equal to good child is equal to good life. You don't get like, I have children in class six saying, I have to study hard because I have to get into good college. You know, you're 11 years old, you're 10 years old. Don't bother about college. Right? But I can't even say that. Their mothers will be shouting at me then. Right? School will be shouting at me then. But yeah, that's, that's true. We are indoctrinating them. This is the right way to live your life. This is, and this uh, illusionary ladder of success. Right? That they have to climb. And this constant thing of not measuring up. I'm not up to the mark. I'm not. If children carry the sense of, and post, I, sorry, I, how long can I go on for? Well, I'm going to interrupt, so we're yeah. moving on. <laughs> uh, what we're planning to do is sort of, you know, 45 minutes of a conversation and then uh, open. Because uh, I can uh, go on and on about I'm this. Aware okay, of that. Yeah. And so, Naba, because you have so much to say. <laughs> and so, I would really recommend uh, reading the book. And though, you know, it's so popular and successful, it's out of stock. And they're hopefully trying to get some copies before the end of the day. The, the uh, LF have sold out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Where how well, uh, <laughs> how much in demand uh, this book and what these ladies uh, have to say is. So I'm going to race along a little bit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and you know what occurred to me when he was, oh, well, one of the remarkable things about the book is the solutions it offers. I mean, down to the detailing, which recommends, for example, that if you are going to give your child a cell phone, make sure it's a prepaid connection. I'm going to ask Abba to tell us why in a minute. <laughs> uh, but that's a kind of detail that it's pointing to. But as you pointed, I think that, that you know, sometimes when uh, we focus on the children, as you, I think this is a much larger issue of adults and their, uh, their norms and their standards and their aspirations and the systems and processes that we have created for our children. And so I think we need to, as the book does, uh, focus equally uh, on the parents and, and what, what they are struggling with themselves and their expectations of for children. So I think that, that interface is a very dynamic one. It's not the children are isolated or the parents are isolated. And we are all subject to this larger malaise that is unfolding. Yet, uh, what is, you know, let's try and be solution oriented in a sense. I mean, the nature of the problem many of us uh, intuit. And, uh, you know, Yuval Harari, the famous sort of Israeli uh, philosopher, he pointed out that uh, uh, the most challenging thing that young people will face is change. Mm. And we have to accept and recognize that. So they will continue to face the kind of ch changes they have faced in the last 10 years and with greater frequency. So he argues that people will have to look at maybe five or six different careers and jobs as the future unfolds. They're going to have that many partners. They're going, their parents are going to have different partners. So this is a, a, a process that is gaining momentum. So uh, in terms of solutions, where and how can we intervene? Uh, you know, we around this room can be mindful. We can you know, deal with this with our own children. But before, by the time they have finished their nine years in school, they'll have another few cataclysmic uh, experiences. So what are some of the, you know, core approaches uh, that we can take to bring about uh, a change for the better. If you read the epilogue, and I hope you get to the epilogue, <laughs> it uh, talks about a VUCA universe, uh, which is a universe which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Ambiguous. This is what you're basically, what Yuval is also saying. Where there are shifting sands of time, and s the s old certainties cannot hold anymore. And one remembers a poem from Yeats, but I won't go down that rabbit hole, otherwise I'll forget my train of thought. In a VUCA world, um, the only thing that will 
work for us is to keep us rooted. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it that roots an individual? And I agree with you, Rajiv, that it has to start with the adults. Unless the adults begin to shift and see how they need to change their success mantra, work hard, get a job, go to X university, make a billion dollar salary, buy a car, go to the States, come back at one level, um, then they are not going to be prepared. For adults to change, I think, is far harder than for children to change. I saw during the pandemic that the young people, I spoke to them after the pandemic as well. And even though I saw that some went under, I was amazed at the number of young people who found that, you know, dug deep and found that resilience within them to say, okay, people are dying around me. I've never experienced loss before. There have been 30 deaths this month. I can't understand this. How do, how do I make meaning of my life? Um, and that is by being of service to others. The number of young people who found the kindness, compassion in themselves to reach out to communities, to use their skills of technology, to be able to get them ambulances, get them oxygen, connect communities, they became wizards at this. And I, that gave me hope, and we will talk about hope, uh, because they found that, whether you call it resilience, whether you call it the meaning of life, which is being interdependent. We all depend on each other. We all need each other, and meaning comes from the relationships that we have with each other, not with the success mantra that we have been fed through the years. And if parents get that shift, children are getting that shift. They are opting out. They are not going down that route. The number of investment bankers who have become bakers, um, I won't say is legion, but I think it's, hey, that's brilliant. You're doing something that is giving you joy and passion. So they are being brave enough to strike out and take a different route and a different path. And they haven't been taught resilience. Because as a generation, I know I have made life easy. We've always, I don't know about you, Shada, but <laughs> we've always tried to make life easier for our children, you know? Um, whereas we shouldn't have. One of my favorite lines is, a little deprivation is a good thing. Uh, the instant gratification that our children have come to assume as an entitlement that you press a button, voila, it's yours. Delayed gratification works. So we didn't give them that resilience. Maybe they saw it in their grandparents, in my parents. I think I am resilient though, I haven't thought about it. but. They have done that. They have picked themselves up. Consciously, I talk in the book a lot about the need for connection with the child at different levels, when they are young and as they get older. Communication, the channels need to be always open, no matter what has happened, no matter how, how many rules, how many boundaries they have crossed. The channel for communication the child needs to know is open, always open. That there is, my parent has got my back. My parent loves me, even though they do not like what I have done. And that comes in the messaging that you give them. So that love is that security that they have. And it's from that security that they get the strength to be able to take on those changes. Connection, communication, conversation. I know you're saying three C's, and you know everybody likes to talk in three C's, five N's, <laughs> 11 D's, or whatever. But <laughs> the conversation and the, the C, it ends with a D, dialogue. Compassion. And compassion. <laughs> um, compassion and kindness, I'm going to take in a separate, right? 
So these are the mechanisms that you use. We don't know. We've stopped. The art of conversation is dead. I realize I didn't complete any of those sentences. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have stopped conversation. We have stopped. We, we, that art is dying. And I don't think we ever knew how to dialogue. I know my father didn't. And members of my family who are here are smiling because uh, he was a patriarch. And um, but a lot of people still are. But um, he was of that generation. <laughs> So you could not tell him anything. Um, there was no dialogue. And we don't know how to dialogue. I don't think I do entirely. I may have instinctively learnt it. But there is a great deal in the book that is talked about dialogue and the art of being able to dialogue with your child. And I think that's very useful. Finally, our children, I'm using that image, analogy, metaphor of the caterpillar. When it's I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, all the time. And then they go into I don't want you at all, which is the chrysalis. And then they emerge as the butterfly. Okay? Um, what emerges at the end will have in its DNA what they see reflected in our eyes. Our love for them, the kindness, respect, and compassion with which we lead our lives, with we treat them and others. And um, then they know they're secure. That may not have answered the question at all. I've forgotten the question. <laughs> Can I just say something? Uh, I think what you said was very important, that how adults need to come together like a collective another C I'll add to it, the collective, the community. Um, working with children, I love working with children. I love, I think educators here would get that. Why do we love working with children? Why do we love working with young? I was joking with Amit, that's my husband, that I think the most meaningful conversations I have. So I was just joking with my husband that um, I have most meaningful conversations in the week with children. Because they, they, you know, they, they, when you ask them questions, they don't use the same language, same thing again and again. They say something what they, they, they feel, right? And another thing is that children are not passive recipients of hardships. We sometimes pathologize children. We think they are broken, they are fragmented, they are fragile. They are not. They, you know, it'll be a dishonor to the hardships they go through, this messy world we brought our world, uh, our children into. And, but they're still surviving, they're still resisting, they're still responding. It's seen as bad behavior, but they are still responding. And what we need to see is like, you know, that Mexican proverb, which I love, they came to dig me, they did not know we were seeds. <laughs> yeah, and they come back, they come back, they come stronger. And what they're looking for is three things. Sorry, they're not C's. Okay. They're looking for meaning, mm -hmm. sense of meaning. They're looking for sense of connection. And very importantly, they're looking for sense of agency. We deprive them us. We don't ask them. We're telling them all the time. Ask a child, what do you want? They will tell you. They'll give you the answers. You know, all the amazing teachers here know that. You know, this whole aspect of controlling the narrative, that's, yeah. that's, that's an area of your work. Yeah. And, and in terms of parenting, could you just sort of briefly reflect on the manner in which the narratives we create for children yeah. are crucial and how they can be modified? How many hours do we have? <laughs> it's like you're talking minutes. about narratives <laughs> now. All right. Narratives is, um, we make sense of this world through stories. Stories give us sense of, sense of meaning to our uh, life. They don't even, they don't just create that sense of meaning, but they shape our lives. Like I like to say, we create stories and stories create us, right? And the other quote that I like to extend, it's an old quote, but I extend it is, the way we talk to our children become the inner voices, the way we talk about them become their life stories, right? So stories are the narratives we build about our children are so important. 
And from the time, even when they're before they're born, we start with the narratives. This one is kicking so much, he'll be a Pele. Or she's so <laughs> gentle. You know the gendered thing, he'll be Pele, he'll be this, she'll be this, already. And then those children are born. Initially, there's a sense of wonder and awe. But then they start going to school. They're not matching up, measuring up. Then the stories start changing. She's, she just doesn't try. He's lazy, not good enough. The narratives start changing. And slowly and slowly, there are some children for whom the narratives are rich, like rainbows. The rich rainbow colors of he, he can play sports, he's so good in studies, he's so polite, he's so responsible, he's so respectable, he's so good at spelling, go on and on. That this one is just a problem child. So black and white and colorful stories. So how is it that who gets what story it depends on so many, you know, that's the intersectionality comes here. What, what is, the, is the child neurodivergent? What, uh, you know, if the child is coming from, um, from uh, the, 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 that section of society which is so, has, faces so much of disadvantages and marginalization, how does that impact the child? How the child is going to grow up? What is happening in the family? What is, what is the sexuality of the child? What is the gender of the child? Is the, ch the, the child identify with the gender they were born in? There's so many things that start impacting the narrative of the child. And schools are like factories of these narratives. We are all part of this. There's a dominant idea that this is the way the child has to be. And everybody has to match up to that. Right? So the narratives and my role as a narrative therapist, as a narrative practitioner, is that sometimes children come with a problem story, is to understand, acknowledge, but also look at the other stories in their life. The stories of resilience, stories of courage, sto stories of standing up. Sto stories of standing up to bullying, or uh, being considerate, or being loving, or compassionate, or communicating. So many other stories which are completely dismissed, obscured, sometimes punished. But that's what narratives are. And I know, I mean, I know some of, I know a lot of teachers here, principals here, who are doing that. Teachers, and I have a very, I always like to joke, I have a love-hate relationship with teachers. I get so annoyed with them, but I love them. I think there's no other profession in this world that can change. If you're looking for solutions, go to school, work with teachers, and ask teachers what can be done. That is, that's, that's where it starts from. We're, we're looking here at uh, a certain class of people, you know, who have the vocabulary for the discourse. And this sort of always raises when we look at the specifics of intervention. Uh, I mean, what percentage of our communities are able to engage with this level of discourse and sensitivity? And yet you have people who come from different strata of society without conscious parenting, either way, uh, who turn out to be remarkable success stories uh, in the ways they live their lives. And you will find in well, cross-section of people. We know, we know people like that. So where is this n nature, nurture, intervention, getting it right? Uh, and sometimes can we be too obsessed uh, self-consciously uh, with getting it right? So is there indeed a right way? <laughs> Would you like to go first? <laughs> I just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> there is no one size fits all in parenting, definitely. There is no right or wrong way. Um, there is your way, there's the child's way, and hopefully the twain will meet. Um, the things that I learned uh, were, see, parenting is for life. And parenting is always work in progress. Um, Guilt for mothers, as you say, is the middle word of parenting. But you have to forgive yourself your failures and not beat yourself up over it, or indeed see them as failures, which is not the best thing in the world. Um, so is there a right way? No. Why do we have books in parenting? Uh, I don't know. Um, but this is not about a book. Um, about parenting per se, but it's about what is happening. Shelda used a wonderful phrase um, 
in, when in our conversation together, which talked about uh, children are the canaries of our time. And the world is fractured. They are not broken, and you've just said that. It is the world that's broken, and they actually reflect that. So I think that um, when it comes to parenting, there's a lot that you do instinctively. There's a lot that you do as learned behavior. My parents did this, therefore I will do that. Or it, the reverse could be true. My parent did that, I will never, ever, ever make that mistake again. You know, someone knows with many nods. Um, so I it works either which way. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Because the direction I was trying to point out, and I didn't fail the question, uh, not an answer. And that was, you know, you have worked with the Delhi government. You have worked with the institutions of education that reach out to uh, parents and families and young people who are not capable or cannot access this sophisticated uh, sounding discourse, though it's very fundamental. So what kind of interventions can we be looking at institutionally? And we're not talking about the Sri Ram School and the Vasant Valley Schools and what have you. Uh, at, at the very least, sort of the, the Delhi government schools who are you know, claiming they're doing happiness programs. So I think it's also useful to reflect on what can we do with our institutions. Uh, it's a very, very small percentage of young people who are uh, you know, as privileged to go to, say, a Krishnamurti school and spend every morning uh, reflecting on the sun and, you know, cultivating okay. that. Shalji, I'll take the first couple of bits and then I'm going to hand to you. The critical area for any intervention is the school, and we both discussed that as well, that it is only when you come together as a community, as we have done today, collectively, parents and teachers, but children are missing, and children, that you can resolve many, many things. And spaces for these kind of conversations need to be created in our schools, government or private, whatever. And spaces that are seen as safe spaces, so that you have excellent facilitation and you have the children's voice heard along with the parents and the teachers in order to come to a solution. There are so many things, Rajiv, that we don't speak about, neither at home nor in schools. We don't speak about sexuality. We don't help children understand their bodies. We all have grown up with a sense of shame about our bodies. We don't talk about sex. We don't talk about gender. We don't talk about LGBTQ, because there are no conversations around that. And most critically, we don't talk about inclusion. And that's inclusion, in my word. So, therefore, you know, there is a whole... I mean, I know I'm veering off again, and you can stop me. But I think that it's conversations, um, fora for discussion uh, on these issues or ways or approaches that is a standard and a need for all schools. Of course, again, bringing this issue of intersectionality, how different kind of discriminations overlap, magnify, uh, and create marginalizations, right? During the COVID, we were working with Delhi government schools, and the reality of parents were 12 family members in one room. What do you even talk about isolation? What do you talk about education? What do you talk about any way is just being cooped up? Right or wh where they had given, you know, uh, education was happening. Amazing, committed gr uh, group of teachers and school mentors who were doing a fantastic job. But mentors saying, "How do we teach when the child says, but I have to go and earn some money for my family. My father's unwell, or I have to stand in a queue for food because there's no being uh, no food at home. How does education happen?" And that's a reality that all of us have to keep in mind that parenting, if it's located in just one family, nuclear family, mother, father, parenting, it's very limited way. Parenting has to go beyond that. Parenting has to take a collective where the teachers, where people like me, therapists, and uh, 
parents and uh, thought leaders and uh, NGOs, everybody comes together and says, okay, what do we need to do? And people who are ready to do some, and our people are doing that. I know here, um, there's a lot of schools here, like Urmila Ma'am's people, people where's Urmila Ma'am there, who, who does amazing work in the community. They are inviting the parents in with the work they're doing in the community. And I know lots of schools are doing that. But yes, we need to stretch ourselves also from our comfort zone and support that. Yeah. I want to touch on this issue of uh, disability because uh, you know disability is varied. It could just be someone who's sort of marginally a slow, le slow learner, uh, somebody who's visually challenged, physically challenged in terms of movement. And uh, I think so much, in, and, 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 and this is sort of so rewarding for us that you have been pointing to the manner in which the sensibilities of the parents, not just their skills, uh, their own sensibilities, their own relationship, their sensibilities to diversity, uh, actually nurture those uh, subliminally in their children. And so many of the crises that we face today and, and for generations to come are how mindful it is for uh, parents need to be about what they are transmitting uh, subliminally uh, to their children. Mm -hmm. So it's not just conscious parenting or even wow. mindful parenting, it's who the parents become. So it's in that sense when, uh, so when Harari was asked that, you know, what should I get my children to study? And he said, philosophy. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and I think that the most important element that is emerging is the emotional intelligence of children and in what ways we can nurture and cultivate their ability to embrace change, mm. uh, even from the discourse of their parents. That's when, in a sense, they really grow up. And it is the institutional framework, uh, with, it all, with all its limitations, uh, and the way we organize that, that can perhaps be the antidote to bad parenting and the terrible things that are happening in society outside. And so, as an institution builder, what are the elements that you have planted in the institutions that you have, you know, set up, uh, advised, uh, that would be the antidote to this almost uh, irresistible thrust? I don't think we're going to be able to pause consumerism, not in, not in a long time, till, till perhaps, uh, you know, the, the, the environment is further in a state of collapse. Uh, to, I mean, you have told us stories of uh, the discourse that you're trying to create in an institution about inclusivity and what happens when they go home. So if we're going to build this hopeful utopia uh, for the future, what kind of institutional interventions in our teachers and you know, people here, scholars here, uh, what kind of systems apart from the owners and the parents who get their parenting right? And th that really is the, the question. I can speak for those schools or institutions that I've been involved with and what I have also seen uh, in my work outside the private sector as well. Um, I think the first starting point is to see the institution as a community. And uh, because it is only by the strength of that community that change can take place with all the stakeholders. I don't you'd like to use the word stakeholders, but I'm using it anyway. Um, so the community coming together has to be driven by the institution uh, to bring everybody on the same page with respect, equality, trust, consensus, decision making. But that means as an institution, you lay yourself open. So you have to be strong enough not to feel that vulnerability. Once you have that strong sense of community, then everything else follows. For the schools that I've been involved with, I'm happy to say that <coughs> an attempt to be an inclusive school, because it is one of the hardest things that you can undertake. And I will not say that inclusive schools have been successful, uh, full stop. Um, but to create an understanding and an acknowledgement of the need to ensure that every child 
has access, not out of kindness or compassion, but out of sense of justice. If there is a child who is seeking admission and that child is differently abled, um, then it is up to the school to find resources to be able to provide that education for that child. It's a uh, work in progress, it's, there have been a lot of trials and etc. So I think that that's the way I would look at it. I would also say the third thing, one is the community, um, the other is inclusion, the third is the culture. Your culture that you create as an institution has to be one that is open and that sends out the message that if we are wrong, we need to acknowledge it. And I find that's shifted in institutions now. You know, everything is perfect. It's, it's like this whole business of we've bought into the whole perfection piece as individuals that, uh, you know, there's the myth of happy families, family is happy, ideal children, loving parents. But it's not like that. We know it's a myth. We, we know life's not like that. We know life's imperfect. But we have to strive every, every which way. So I think that um, the openness to critique and review one's shortcomings is one uh, thing I hope, uh, not hope, I know, is still very much there. Um, over to you, Shelter. Yeah, well, um, yes, I think it's, uh, you know, when you ask this question, I'm thinking of social change, right? It's like a social change. And how does we look in the past and see, or we look at the present, actually, and see how does social change happen? Social change happens when different people come together. And uh, it could be the social change that is happening in terms of uh, the anti race movement or LGBTQ movement or different movements across the world where everybody is part of it. It's not that I don't have a child, I don't have to be part of it or my child. Have, all of us have to be part of this social movement where some people are thought leaders, some people are at the front line, the parents and the teachers. Some are uh, more of story weavers, you know, the writers, the story weavers, the different people who come together and say, okay, what do we do to sustain this movement? And I think that's the only way. And I feel the hub of it has to be schools. What happens when there's an earthquake, when there's a major natural disaster? Where, d where does it, where do people come together to find sanctuary. It's in schools, right? So what we need to do is where the schools, because schools are naturally the place where parents, teachers, everybody comes together. And that will be the space where the social change can happen, is already happening. That's why we're having this conversation. Yeah, I should just add that it's sort of, very often it's uh, individual teachers yes. or the presence of individuals such as you and many of uh, uh, your colleagues here who can catalyze that change uh, in, a, in, in a student, and I think we've all had that experience of the individual in the institution who's made a difference. Uh, but equally, it's a much longer discussion and debate as to what is happening with the very structures of education in India that are perpetuating yes. uh, uh, you know, all that uh, we find painful and, and uh, counterintuitive. But uh, I had promised to open this up to the floor, and I shall have to give up my privilege of exclusively talking to wonderful minds, and so uh, we're open to the first hand that comes up. I'm looking. <laughs> so my shima is uh, brain as parents. Uh, we try to do the best for our children, but we also know the mirrors behavior is steep. So when we talk about the ideas, I hope see a guilt that travels throughout when we sometimes are not at our best behavior and we're being watched very closely and absorbing it like a sponge. And while we can be very careful in how we're dealing with them, but we're not very careful in how we're dealing with other adults around them in our relationships. And I want to understand that thing. I'll start with a story, yeah? And this was uh, after my first book came out, my book on parenting. And uh, I snapped at my daughter, yeah? And uh, which was my fault. 
<laughs> totally. You know, books, people who write books on parenting and talk about parenting. Yeah, so snapped at her and she went off to her room. After some time, I felt really bad and knocked on the door. And I went in and I said, I'm really, really sorry. So she was reading a book. So I said, what are you reading? She shows me my book and says, piece of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Well, Abha, it's up to you to okay. so bring in the reality check. <laughs> no, I've had reality checks all, all, all the time and very much like this as well. Um, sometimes teachers make difficult parents. As the book tells you, there were several times when we were at loggerheads. And after, uh, you know, particularly in the teens when they shut you out. And I only realized much, much later that they need to shut us out. There is a reason why they're shutting us out. Nobody taught us that, but as, a, as an adult, and through the research in this book, I, I realized that how the teenager's brain is changing, and why it needs to change, and that distance, they need to do that because it, they're creating their sense of self and identity. Now, one didn't know that 20 odd years ago or more. And uh, so I would keep losing it. And I realized that losing it is the worst thing you can do. With your students, and as teachers, we know that. And now students can get us to a point where we flip and they say, nailed it, <laughs> she's lost it. Uh, so I would keep losing it with him. And uh, he one day turned around to me and said, you call yourself a principal? You can look after two and a half thousand children, but you can't handle one. You don't remember this, do you? <laughs> but you can't handle one child. So that shut me up. I mean, my, my days of... Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Your communication about narratives, I truly believe in. But I also think what's important is that we as human beings and individuals, we absorb and pick up the narratives and live those narratives. And those narratives have mechanisms within them that get activated. But they are so directly connected with the personalities and the archetypes of the personalities that we want to live through in this time and age. And I think that's something that teachers or institutions or generally is not really looked at because that's the, that's the overlook, the overview of the narrative, and therefore the overview of the behavior and the responses. And also, I really truly believe in this time of change, we are the blind leading the blind. So this whole concept of parenting is on many levels also needs redefinition. And the parenting related to what? To you as a principal, or to, which is also administrative, or to you as just an individual with your children, and maybe even your spouse, because there's so much parenting that goes on there too. So, so I, think, I think there's so many levels here, but at the same time, the most important level right now is the environmental level because it's situational. The situation has got an archetype that needs to be addressed and managed. A question at the lady at the back, and then the lady in the second row. I work with uh, children in the rural areas of Jharkhand. Uh, so um, this is a question which is related to what you said about not having in enough discussions on gender, IT, and so on. Uh, what we find very important in our areas is also conversations and relatives and religion, for example. So, uh, and you don't have to answer this question if it's uh, not answerable right now, but it's something that is concerns us a great deal. Do you think that we can start conversations on different religions? I think it's a very sensitive issue, and it could be loaded. But what I do believe very strongly is for children to grow up with a healthy respect and a celebration of all faith. 
So if we look at it from the perspective of celebration of faith, no matter what shape or form it comes in, um, then that's fine. The discussion on religion, I don't think is an area for young children to um, have, you know, to, to go down. What we did try um, many years ago, we wanted to, this was uh, not necessarily triggered by anything, and I can't remember the exact date when it started. Um, I think it started before 2002, um, which as you know was a, a, a year of tremendous violence. We wanted our children, our older children, in class 11, to begin to, to just have an understanding and an appreciation of the universality of all faith, that they all actually believe in the same things. And so we had curated experiences for them, visits to mosques, gurdwaras, churches, temples, to the synagogue, uh, to Jain temples, and visiting, um, let's say, do you remember that, Rajiv? I think I got in touch with you as well. So, you know, monasteries. So there were people who would come and give talks, and uh, um, highly regarded, wise individuals. And I think that gave our older children an understanding of, an appreciation of the, of the richness of the diversity of faith, without calling it comparative religion, you know? And I, somehow religion becomes, it brings out the worst in, in us, whereas faith is a personal feeling. I mean, that's my belief. Sorry. Well, just to uh, add to that very important uh, question and, and uh, desperate need uh, for our times. And, uh, you know, the challenge really for an institution is that how do you and something as elemental as religion and faith uh, antidote or go counter to the dominant discourse in the home? Uh, I think many of us of our generation uh, grew up without a sense of distinction. And we now find that we have friends who sometimes alarm us by their own positions uh, on diversity. And so I think that uh, the earlier that uh, the, uh, institutionally we can plant the seeds of celebrating diversity, and uh, not merely in terms of religion, but I think also in terms of uh, uh, the differently abled, for example. And if we can respect and celebrate diversity uh, at the core of our being, uh, the younger the child, that they can grow up with an increasing, uh, increase or enhanced sense of openness to other traditions. Mm -hmm. And then to have the opportunity for the experiential aspect that Abba spoke about, which I think is also extremely crucial, so that it just doesn't stay in the mind, but we, in a sense, uh, humanize what our parents or who our parents consider as enemies. And I think it's also, a, I think many schools follow this, uh, you know, practice of, you know, the kind of uniform and, and, and the dress you wear. It's a controversial subject, but I think there is an argument uh, so that people are not seen as being distinct or different, but just as fellow human beings uh, as best we can uh, nurture that belief. Question here on the second row, and then I'll come to you. Thank you, Abba, for a remarkable book, and congratulations to Pujita and Alef uh, for making this possible. Um, my first question is third. It is about what is the real crisis that our society currently faces? And it's one of intolerance. It's one of othering. And hopefully, there will be institutions within institutes of learning, institutional practices in the hidden curriculum that will provide an antidote. So that's already been a... My other question is that your book talks about some very disturbing aspects of substance abuse, of self-harm as, as an attention getting device. And I found that very alarming because the rate at which this is happening among young people, you suggest, 
uh, is something that I wasn't really familiar with at such a young age, that students are resorting to these desperate measures. I just would like you to, since the uh, moderator didn't draw your attention to that, I would like you to please... <laughs> I should just add, when you're bringing that together, uh, what the questioner didn't draw your attention to, and has been her experience, I think, in, 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 uh, in college, is sexual abuse, and how often that is within the family, and, and parents are sort of in that mise en sense, in a sense. Uh, and, and how, you know, how do parents begin to address this? Thank you so much, Dr. Gopinath, for bringing that to the moderator's attention. <laughs> I couldn't resist that. So, you know, this is one of the things that crept up on us as educators. I think in the early 90s, we were all um, becoming aware that uh, all was not right with the world. And children were on the brink of being anorexic, in some cases, bulimic. Um, they were going off food. Body image was coming into play, right? But self-injury hadn't reared its head then. And this is a specter, I think, is again, uh, last 10 years, which, um, and the statistics are staggering now. There are no official statistics. Informally, I hear that it's across the demographic. Depend, it, it has nothing to do with how privileged or elite you are. It has everything to do with how anxious and worthless you feel. And as we know, our children are not feeling good about themselves at the moment, and we've discussed that. So I'm just going to read to you. I don't think it's always catching attention, but in a way, what I'm going to read to you, this, this particular um, young gentleman, I have changed all the names, and uh, I'm, I've called him Kirat. And then I'm going to read to you a poem written by a s somebody who admitted that she used to cut herself. Um, so, Kirat is 18 years old. He's a bright, sensitive, and ethical young man who broke down during a tutorial with his tutor. And his tutor was very dismayed, and she said, you know, he's not the kind of kid who does that. I felt it's emotional abuse over years, and he was cutting himself because he desperately needed his parents' attention. He trusted me enough to talk to me, said, his, said the counselor, and he said, ma'am, I've got cuts, and my parents especially my mom, just does not notice me. I have cuts on my arms and I sit in my t-shirt <coughs> next to her. And she's never noticed. He said, I've not been able to stop once I started and I've used a blade. So on the counselor's recommendation, he began to see a therapist, but his parents were in denial. And they stopped the sessions because antidepressants had been prescribed. Uh, they said the medication would make him drowsy and would impact his studies. And um, he's got to work towards getting into Ivy League institutions. Well, he didn't make it to the Ivy League. We kept track of that, but he's fine in the sense that he's made it to a college. When this, this specter of depression and cutting and they were all trying it out and we didn't know. You know, it, it, came, it came to light much, much later. So we did a workshop on depression and we developed a short piece, a piece of theater around it. And one student, a drama student, decided that I'm going to write my personal experiences of self-harm. I said, okay, that's fine. And this is what this 14-year-old had to say. At first, it's nothing. 
just ignoring the feeling of something, you start to think, you stop and wonder how you got yourself into this mighty blunder. The blood of the slits dripping from your wrists leaves you more satisfied than the time you hid and cried. You feel like you're locked away, there's no escape, you're forced to stay. You ponder on how it's made such an impression, this room of hell that you're locked in, you realize, is depression. And um, <coughs> she said it. I mean, we actually did a piece of uh, physical theater around it, and she voiced it. And her mother was uh, so very, very upset. But, uh, you know, they spoke. She went to counseling. And many of the ones, I mean, the book has many such uh, instances, but many of the students that I spoke to who admitted, yes, ma'am, I cut myself. I said, why? I was going through a bad time. I said, what does that mean you were going through a bad time? My parents were getting divorced. My brother was in college. I was all alone. I was doing badly. I had no one to talk to. You know, that connect conversation, communication, that someone, that wise elder to turn to. And she said, so I said, how do you feel? And it's not going to it's there. She says, you know, it's a release. And so the next time you feel bad, you do it again. So this continues until you take the final step. <laughs> Student suicides in India are the highest in the world. We are the most depressed country in the world. I don't want to end like this, uh, Shalja. We, we, we had decided that, that we would uh, talk about hope. <laughs> but um, these, this is the reality. And uh, unless we as adults, you know, really shift our spiritual centers, I don't think that we are going to be able to help our children. I am going to request, because this is, uh, uh, I mean, there's plenty of data on depression, and uh, I, I, I think we'd be missing something if we didn't uh, dwell on that. And uh, I think the question that, uh, uh, it's a more difficult question to answer as to why people we get, depre get depressed. And I think the substance of the book, in a sense, is that if, if, you, if, uh, uh, if you had to cope with all the things that young people have to cope with, you'd have to have remarkable resilience not to be depressed. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I mean, you know, very often uh, children will report to parents, teachers will report to parents or to each other that so-and-so child is depressed. So first to give us a sense of, you know, what the signals are, uh, what does it mean to be depressed, uh, not just how clinically people understand it, uh, but what are the signs we should be looking at that this needs intervention. And then, of course, there is the usual discussion and argument between therapy and pharmacology. I think that's very much in, in, in the public domain. So could you? Yeah. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little. Uh, and then I'll come and zoom into that particular question. Because sometimes I know I hear this a lot. We don't have enough therapists. We don't have enough psychiatrists. Uh, in these last 30 years, um, the number of psychiatrists and therapists are just growing and growing and growing, and so is the mental health problem growing and growing, right? So answer cannot be more therapists and psychiatrists. Are we asking the wrong questions? Are we looking for the wrong solutions? You know, look at the daily pollution and what it does to our chest. I always have to carry this medicine with me all the time because I don't know when I'm going to start coughing, right? If we start locating the problem in our chests, you know, go for nebulizers and go for chest specialists and go to the best doctors. That's really being, you know, trivializing the problem <coughs> to the individual, right? And it's like the Delhi pollution. We have to find larger solutions for this. And what, we, what I'm meeting, when I'm meeting children right now, what are they saying? Most children say, I can't see myself alive after four years, five years. I don't think I'll ever reach 20, and I don't think I'll reach 30. There's a sense of climate crisis. There's a huge sense of anxiety. Sense of where is this world coming to? The kind of uh, the political injustices, the injustices they see around the world, in their country, everywhere. There's a sense of despair. 
That's a larger thing, right? And then, um, you know, in narrative therapy, we have a mantra. The person is not the problem. The problem is the problem, and the problem is mostly social. And to look at that becomes so important. So depression, rather than locating the problem in the person, we look at the larger social, cultural, political context. And that becomes very important that what is, I mean, of course, is a process of how do we do it in therapy and how do we locate it. Uh, talking about depression, as somebody who, I have been through depression myself, and I talk very openly about it in my book I've written, in my workshop, everything. In my, when I'm talking to young people, I talk very openly about it because I don't see a sense of why I shouldn't be talking about it. I think depression is something, what is depression? Depression is where if you, if you, you know, the closest that comes to it of all the Harry Potter fans is the Dementors, right? When they suck the happiness out of you. Where there is a sense of coldness, the gray, there's a sense of disconnection. The three things I talk about, meaning, agency, and connection. You lose connection, you get isolated, you lose a sense of meaning and hope, and there's no sense of agency. Right? And that's what young people are saying, that there's a sense of despair. If in your children, as teachers, as parents, they, and this can come through in any way. Sometimes it comes through as anger. Sometimes it comes through as so-called bad behavior. Sometimes it comes through as cutting. Sometimes it comes through as refusing to go to school. Sometimes it comes through as not eating food. Sometimes it comes through as substance abuse. Right? There are different ways this depression shows up. We have to be on the lookout. We can't see that as, oh, bad behavior. Right? We have to see the child is trying to, you know, sometimes when I'm uh, asked this question about drug abuse in our country, where class six, class seven, almost every second kid is holds, has a vape, is vaping. I, the question I ask, being a little provocative, is what else will they do? They're doing the best they can. I mean, this is, this is how they're trying to survive through that, the, the numb, the, the pain, the thing, what? Let me just smoke up and try to numb the pain. So what we have to do is start understanding, listening, communication, listening to them, and really understanding what do we do when children come to us, we listen to them. There's no judgment, there's a safe space. It invites meaning, what gives your life meaning? It invites agency, it invites connections, and it invites connection, just not me and the person, but that person and the family. That person and like this mother, I would want to know What's happening with the mother? What is disconnecting her from the child? What is she going through? Is she going through depression? Is she trying to live up to the society's idea of some person being a certain person? So, you know, I am a little sensitive about mothers because I think psychiatry and psychology has a history of mother blaming, which I'm really sensitive. Anybody talk about mother as like, okay, hold on, who's going to say that anything about mothers? Yeah, we can't. I mean, that's that's enough. Enough mother blaming has happened. Uh, in our society, but sorry, I lost the track, but I think, did I, somehow, yeah? Oh. How? Why does a parent? Yes. Uh, and uh, look, looks at, I mean, we understand the largest of Yes. So you've told us to look out. Yes. But how does the parent intervene? We're having interventions. Yeah. We've talked about we've been goodness. Yes. I'm trying it's out of control. It's desperate. Who sold therapy, of apology? So, sort of a practical advice on when, what. Is yeah, so the best, you know, when the parents, and I'm talking about a time when you need professional help. If you need, pro I know some amazing teachers, some in this room also, who are better therapists than therapists. I have struggled with some children. They go and find that teacher and suddenly everything is okay. So teachers, finding the right teachers, right principals, school counselors, and school counselors who just don't pitch in to do disciplinary action, right? Don't pitch in to do psychology, uh, teaching psychology. Safe space where children can go to and talk to and confidentiality is maintained that this is your space, I'm not going to tell whatever you've shared with the teacher and say, you know, your child, he did this, right? That safe space. And yes, for therapists, I don't know how many therapists and counselors are here. I think the most important thing is find a therapist who connects to your child and respects the child. Respects the child, is willing to listen to the child, and includes you. If they leave you in the waiting room, that's not good. 
you have to include families in it. You have to, because you can't do that. The child is like mothers say, child has been going for therapy for 15 sessions. I have no idea what's happening. That's not OK. You know, child is going back to the same home. Include the families. Include the parents. Right? So that's very important. As far as uh, medication is concerned, I'm not the expert. Uh, and, but if the child needs, it's a matter of safety of the child and the medication can help, I would say do anything to help the child if the child is suffering, get the medication, get the therapy, do whatever needs, stop the child doesn't can't go to school, stop the school, it's okay. Right now the mental health, the survival of the child is more important than that school which is not gonna be able to help at all. Thank you. This has been a really important discussion. So I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things. One was that I totally uh, agree with what Abha is saying about consumerism. I've been working on youth suicide and so on and in, the, in, um, in Sikkim especially and on how uh, linking that to consumerism. To the, as you're saying, the last 10 years is incredible rise of consumerism and the effect it's having on young minds. Um, I'm a psychologist, so, <laughs> and <laughs> so I, I, one thing I wanted to ask you, and also interestingly, I, we found that a class that had, was being taught by a sociologist on critical thinking, their, uh, the relationship between the, their uh, scores uh, on the, the questionnaire we gave and anxiety was not significantly, was not significant, whereas for the other groups, it was very significant the ones who were really kind of vulnerable to consumer message messaging. So that's one possible way to deal with this problem, just one thought, is uh, to teach critical thinking about consumerism in the school system. But the other thing I was going to ask about uh, what Shalda was saying about uh, how do you bring about change, you know, social change, and uh, schools as a hub for the community and to bring about change. And I was just, I was going to ask what kinds of uh, roles you have to include in the p personnel of the school. And f as for example, I used to teach in, a, uh, in the U.S. in a school for, or in a college for very disadvantaged, low-income minority students who were first generation. And we found that they were just not prepared for school, you know, because they're coming from very impoverished school systems and the backgrounds they were coming from. And all of our discussions and as faculty and, and staff were, how do we, you know, they need much more than teaching. They need social work, they need counseling, they need, you know, a community liaison, they need parent, you know, you have to bring the community together. So I was going to ask here in India, if any, because I totally, uh, agree with, you know, again, the school is an important hub. Does, is that happening here where, you know, we have to reimagine the structure of the school and the education system? Can we bring in other roles other than just teaching? Because it's putting too much of a burden on the teacher to expect them to do all, everything, be the mental health counselor as well as teach, as well as deal with, you know, all the uh, environmental issues. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Yes. I think that your question Sorry. is in place. <laughs> <laughs> Rajiv, can I just hijack the mic for a second because it's just passing by me and I want to just expand parenting in the age of anxiety to being parents in the age of anxiety and my question is that I find that a lot of young people are deciding not to become a parent. Is that also a sense of despair? Is that a phenomenon that you would agree is a result of what we've been talking about? So I think we'll just hold this and let, Aunt, you know, let, them, let the questions come and then you can respond to them collectively. One myth that needs to be busted is the digital myth in terms of when you talked about climate anxiety and that, you know, uh, the, the digital is far better for the climate or environment than paper. Uh, I read a, uh, something that was published in the BBC recently which said... Uh, this song called the song called Despacito was streamed about seven or eight billion times, and the energy consumed to watch that song was equivalent to uh, the electricity consumed by five West African countries in an in an entire. Year. So, my I have seen and. Okay. 
I was recently with some kids, six of them together. They were trying to come together for some workshop that was given, uh, activity given by the school. And between, in that half an hour, there were 196 WhatsApp messages. Uh, the car has come, I'm sitting here, I'm here, uh, now I'm down at the, now I'm outside your door, now I'm ringing the doorbell, you know, and all of that. We know that stillness is an antidote to anxiety as well as to depression. And when we were kids, and Abha, you know that, when we were in school and in college, when there was, when you had to do an activity and you had to bring people together, there was one paper given a time and a space and it was posted on a notice board. And everybody gathered at that time. There are so many teachers here and principals here. What do you think teachers and schools can do to bring back that sense of stillness? And it worked fine. I graduated school in 2005 and I'm a young parent now and it's going to soon be time for me to think about what school my kids go to and the decision fills me with a cold dread because you guys are very optimistic about schools being the space for change but schools were the worst zone of exploitation and emotional damage when I was growing up. I went to a school very close to where we are right now. We had a teacher who called a Muslim kid a terrorist in the heydays of 9-11. We had a teacher who was absolutely obsessed with the length of girls' skirts and the color of their undergarments, and that was her mission in life. Uh, these facts were known to the principal, and nothing was done. We had incidents of self-harm that everybody knew about, but the school did nothing about. Um, the, there was a sports teacher who was a known drunk on campus. There was another teacher who was me too a few years ago, and the society in charge of that school has not set up a, an inquiry committee. This is a very well-respected, reputable school. I can see there are parents from that school right here. <laughs> what do we do? Uh, why are you so optimistic about schools being agents of change? I think that, uh, I think that the, the, the key issues really are what happens when you have a terrible school and, and how do you deal with that? And I think the second issue is about uh, you know, let's give the parents a, a, a little bit of a dose. That's social change that she talked about, and I will talk about the bad society and what we can do it. But uh, your responses to the questions. Yeah, <laughs> my heart was sinking when I was hearing you say that. Not only because, oh, because I, every time you were saying this, it resonated with one experience I've had with work talking to a child, a child locked up in a so-called rat room, a child being called an antakwadi or a terrorist, or, you know, kind of institutional violence that happens in school. I totally am with you. So yes, it seems like a very far-fetched idea to think how can we create safe spaces in schools? But I don't see an alternative, and I see the change that can happen in not good, forget about good schools, good enough spaces. Forget about good, good enough spaces when one teacher decides, I want to do something different. When one principal decides, one management decides that I want to be inclusive. One person decides that a child from the EWS is just not plus three, or ch children with autism are not just plus four, they're part of my class, and I am responsible, I am accountable. I see that happening, that's why that gives me hope. And I know the teachers in this room who believe that, and I don't see any alternative, that's why I believe in it really wholeheartedly. Yeah? I agree with Shelja, and I'm looking at the person who's brought about change in her class every single year by building them into communities. And I think you should read about it in the book. I think uh, uh, there still remains, uh, you know, the question of parental anxiety and, and how we might respond to that and nurturing stillness. Uh, I mean, the question that, you know, Vidyan asked, that in terms of the practical aspects, well, we've talked about what children can do, but what can parents can do? Can Go I to just start themselves? with that, Abha, just uh, trying to address that and then yes, you yes, take yes, over? Yes, 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 I believe that parenting is not about bringing up children. It's about growing up ourselves. Yeah, we have to grow up ourselves. I don't think anybody helped me learn that, my children, right? They were like my mirrors, showing me every moment, you know, what I was doing wrong. They helped me heal. They helped me become, you know, a little better person. So yes, parental anxiety is there, 
but i think parents have to ask how much are they buying into this dominant idea of this good child once you let go of that and constantly it's a daily thing am i doing it because i'm scared of the societal pressure of the ptm what the teachers will say what my mother in law will say or everybody blaming the mother and saying tumhari wajah se hua it's your anxiety opt out of that dominant discourse and you'll find anxiety itself and of course you know things like yes yeah, stillness right stillness makes a difference and stillness i know that how if we are being able to connect to anxiety and be you know i remember when i used to teach my child and i would be sitting especially doing math with him i would get so worked up then i suddenly i would take like take a deep breath and like calm down okay count till whatever and then come back and i once i remember he was trying to explain me something and i was like i don't get it and he's like hold on <laughs> <laughs> so they learn from us yeah <laughs> i would just like to say that you need to see samina mishra's film um the that's how the children in the classes who are undergoing the happiness curriculum are doing this the the, the breathing and it is helping them i think that uh, all of these uh, all of this understanding and realization doesn't come ready made when you become a parent you learn from your kids yes and uh, you grow with them absolutely right and the realizations hit you much much later so now you're sitting in a position which is you know so please don't think that i have had a completely blameless uh, um faultless anxietyless parenting journey i mean i don't want to let my son loose on this topic but i have been a horrendously anxious parent i still am an anxious parent i'm a worrier uh, by by nature and um, but i've learned to deal with my anxiety and the stillness is part of it this the meditation and you help me with that yeah Well, just uh, uh, I think sort of the takeaway as a gathering of uh, predominantly parents, want to be parents, people chose not to be parents, etc., etc., etc. I think uh, the main takeaway is that I think parents uh, need to start uh, getting their act together. And uh, if you need any consolation on how challenging and difficult it is, I'm going to tell you a story about the Dalai Lama. And um, you know there is this happiness curriculum in the Delhi government schools, which derived from uh, uh, his his approach uh, to equanimity, and I think it sought to redefine our aspirations uh, as far as anxiety is concerned. And you know our threshold for anxiety is dropping, and uh, because we, uh, I mean, we are being trained to say that uh, you can live a life. without anxiety without emotional stress and the american dream of a syncretic synthetic kind of happiness and i think that that's a broad based expectation that we have assigned to ourselves and to our children and so there was a there was a there was a, a, a huge conference in dharamsala where uh, you know people came in from all over the world and were talking about their interventions and techniques and practices that they were giving their classrooms and their children and their communities and how wonderfully transforming it was you know for example the education <coughs> minister of delhi uh, when reporting on the happiness curriculum to the dalai lama said you know it's amazing we've been running this uh, program uh, for a year and when the children used to go out in the morning they used to scream and rave and rant uh, with their mothers ki wo tumne roz paratha de diya hame khane ke liye now there's such a change and you know sort of less than 6 months that they now come home and say mummy aapne kha liya and you know similar narratives of how amazing this transformation was so the dalai lama is 85 years old at that time and he said you know uh, i started practicing the highest practices of you know stillness and mindfulness and what have you and i'm 84 years old and i was discovered when i was 5 and i started formal practice when i was 7 But you know, behavior change, not much. <laughs> I still get angry, but the only consolation is that I get my equanimity back a little quicker. So just with that reassurance, 
that it's a tough road ahead. Uh, good luck to us all. Thank you. The book has to be launched, copies of which, <laughs> copies of which you already have. And uh, they have been such wonderful speakers and the sound of my own voice has sort of, I'm afraid, so an apology. This is a photo opportunity we cannot miss.